Aloha and welcome to our third and final day of our webinar series. This is our OLP series, and this year we are focused entirely on the processes and practice of teaching Mandarin Chinese in an online environment. And we really appreciate everyone coming out today. It's been a fantastic couple of days of very robust discussion, and we hope that you're enjoying the series as much as we are and our panelists are. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Today's format is going to go a lot like the other days. We are going to have a list of questions we'll go through with our panelists, and they will add their thoughts on how they interact and, and handle those items. And these are items today that are going to be focused primarily on assessment and feedback. Those are two really important components whenever we are teaching online, and we do hope you enjoy today's discussion. We will also have a short break around the top of the hour. Just take a moment to stretch our legs, and we'll go ahead and resume at the end of the session, we do hope to have a little bit of interactive Q&A with all of you. We do invite you, if you'd like, to go ahead and turn on your web camera and your microphone, and you can address the panelists if you'd like. And if you have any questions or concerns as we're going through our conversation organically, please don't hesitate to put those into the chat. Sometimes that adds a little bit of extra feedback for us and areas to cover that we might not have initially thought of. So without any further delay, I do want to go ahead and introduce you to our panelists. And this group of panelists today, again, is a fantastic group. Today, I'm going to go ahead and go in alphabetical order, just kind of keeping it random here. And I will go ahead and introduce our panelists to you. So starting off today, we have Matt Koss. Matt is a PhD student in second language studies at Michigan State University. He has 12 plus years of both Spanish and Mandarin in person and online education experience from novice to superior level, elementary to university level and ages ranging all the way from three to 80. His research focuses on the connections between research and practice, focus on task-based language teaching and assessment, language program design and evaluation, and educational psychology. He holds a BA in Hispanic linguistics and Chinese, and also a master's in second language acquisition from the University of Maryland. Also joining us today is Kay Peng, and she is the director of the Chinese flagship program and professor of Chinese at Western Kentucky University. And she teaches all levels, modern Chinese language and second language acquisition, also teaching methods of foreign language, content courses on Chinese culture, history, and literacy Chinese from advanced all the way up to the superior level. She has a doctorate in Chinese linguistics with a focus on second language acquisition and teaching from the University of Arizona. She also holds a master's in foreign language education from Indiana University. Also joining us today is Penny Wong, and she is an editor, researcher, translator, bilingual writer, and online course developer. She's also editor-in-chief of the Handbook of Research on Foreign Language Education in the Digital Age. She also is an associate lead of the Chinese Language Teachers Association USA, the EdTech SIG. She also is the vice president of Iowa Chinese Language Teachers Association, she holds a master's in bilingual ELL education and a doctorate in language literacy and technology from Washington State University. So as you can see, we have quite a panel today. I am very excited to get into today's discussion and that is about assessments and feedback. And this is a really critical area to discuss because students online sometimes might struggle a little bit in the online world and we need to make sure that our assessments are accurately showing us what are our students acquiring from our input from our lessons. And feedback is very, very important as well, because it's important for our students to know what their strengths are and where they might need to improve. So I do hope everyone enjoys our discussion today. And we'll go ahead and start this one and starting off with Koslov sheet today. And like talking about more in general, what is it about Chinese language that might make it a little bit more challenging to assess students more specifically in that online environment when they are learning Mandarin Chinese? Kas Laoshi, if you can start us off with that one, please. Sure. I think there is a there's a there's a couple things. Um, one of them that to me the solution is quite obvious, though this may be a controversial topic, and I'm okay with that. Um, so one, one immediate challenge that comes to mind for many teachers, and I remember there being a lot of sort of discourse in our field when the pandemic broke and we suddenly were 
forced to all go online was the idea of assessing writing ability. Uh, and that's a big topic in Chinese pedagogy. One of the bigger issues I think that we haven't resolved well there is uh, often there's a conflation between do we mean writing and are we specifying modality or are we specifying the skill, right? Are we talking about ability to produce letters or characters or symbols, right, graphemes, or are we talking about the ability to compose text? Because when we talk about writing in terms of proficiency, in terms of the national standards, in terms of most of our state standards, we're talking about the ability to compose text, and that is medium agnostic, so to speak. We're not talking about specifically whether you can handwrite or whether you can type, and that's sort of a non-starter for most languages, right? It's, it's a particular concern for many teachers for Chinese for a variety of reasons. I'm actually co-editing a book on this topic right now. Uh, so it's it's quite a big topic, both in the online space, but even in the face-to-face -face classroom, sort of what does writing mean and how do we assess it? And how do we make sure, sort of what standard do we hold our students to? Should they be forced to write characters by hand from memory? And what does that look like in an online space? Does that mean they have a digital tool like a tablet that they then write on and like take a screenshot of and submit? Is it that they write something on paper and they take a picture of it and they submit it? You know, Chinese teachers are nothing if not thorough. So liking to do things like, oh, you missed a stroke here, you missed a stroke there becomes a little bit complicated when you're writing on top of a piece of paper that someone submitted digitally, right? So there's some tool challenges there. But I actually don't think that's as big of an issue as we make it. I think we, as a field, have a lot of reckoning to do with what we prioritize in terms of what writing means anyway. So I think the challenge isn't so much in the online space of assessment as it is with us as a field and us as individual teachers, clarifying kind of what we mean by writing ability, for example, and how we want to teach it, how we want to assess it, what is realistic to expect from our learners to achieve in the very limited amount of time that they have with us, even in a flagship program like Peng Lao Shi has the awesome uh, opportunity to be a part of, you know, they really are with us for a very limited amount of time overall in their life. So expecting that they're going to sort of go through the same literacy development path as an L1 user who has hours and hours and hours and years and years and years and a very differentially developed sort of linguistic system when they start that literacy development process, I think is something we as a field need to grapple with. And then on the other hand, you have the challenges that are not unique to Chinese, right? Those assessing interpersonal speaking, for example, in the online space, which looks really different if you're teaching asynchronously versus synchronously. Um, and that's certainly not unique to Chinese, but it is something we more and more are trying to figure out. And I think there are a lot of really nice tools and there's something to be considered at least from the various kind of big assessments that exist in our field when we have these restrictions imposed on us by, you know, we only have access to certain tools or we're only teaching in a certain way. Um, so for example, the AP Chinese assessment, right, which is something that's heavy on high school teachers' minds and even is on the minds of those of us who are in higher ed a little bit because we're dealing with things like, do what do they get credit for, for example? The AP test doesn't do live interpersonal assessment, right? It's what you might call semi-interpersonal, right? It's a prompt that's pre-recorded that everybody gets the same prompt and then you respond by recording an answer. So it lacks a little bit of that kind of naturalness in interaction, but it actually, and it has been criticized for being kind of non-authentic, right? But I would actually argue all the Chinese teachers here probably are users of WeChat, which many years before uh, like iMessage on iPhones developed the ability to do voice texting. And voice texting is asynchronous. I record something, send it to you, you hear it, and you eventually record a response. And that is sort of an interpersonal way of interacting. Um, so I think we have a lot of interesting tools at our disposal. Often it is, we need to be a little bit creative, but we also need to be really thoughtful and intentional about what is it, what is the skill that we want to develop? How do we mean proficiency, performance? What ability do we care about the students developing? And then what we assess, I will be the, I, this is the hill I'm willing to die on, right? What we assess is what we value. 
And what we assess then is what students will value. So if we say communication is the most important thing, but we're testing their ability to handwrite characters accurately, are we testing what we value? If we say the most important thing is interactional ability, but we're testing their ability to memorize a dialogue, I'm not saying that's a bad test. I'm saying that's a misalignment of value, right? So I think we as a field really have to be careful to think about what are the things we care about? What are our priorities given limited time? And then how are we going to test them in the constraints that exist in an online space or even in a not online space? Excellent points. And I also like how you talked about how you specifically sometimes will use technology to kind of bridge those gaps, sometimes writing over top of things. And I really liked your example about WeChat, how that is an interactive communication that's happening, not synchronously necessarily, but it is also very much the interactive communication. So thank you for sharing your insights on that. And I'll go ahead and pass that question to Peng Laoshi. Again, it's the same question talking about what is it about Mandarin Chinese that makes it challenging to assess students more specifically in that online environment? And if you want to talk a little bit about how you use technology to bridge those gaps, we'd love to hear your insights on that too. Um, I Yeah, this is a great question. I agree with uh, Gao Lao Shi or Kaos Lao Shi on his uh, insight about you know the alignment of value in assessment. I think um, for from what I see, the the biggest challenge sometimes is uh, the teacher's um, sensitivity or uh, how up to date in technology uh, in their assessment uh, tools. So uh, in the past, we use a lot of paper pencil tests and uh, traditional listening reading tests and uh, without involving the interaction part or, uh, but when we are teaching in an online environment, uh, we are in order to uh, help students uh, keep engaged or um, interested in the class uh, and continue uh, to um, interact with other students in the online environment. So we we were um, we we had to do some changes. We had to make some changes to performance based assessments. For example, sometimes it may have to do with projects or may have to do with uh, tasks. Um, uh, one of the tools I like uh, to use uh, in projects uh, is Padlet. Um, I like the uh, the fact that students can um, collaborate with others and then uh, they they can even turn it into a Kanban board and then say, okay, this is what we are doing. This is what we are going to do. And this uh, is what we have done for this project. And then uh, it's a process. So uh, that's one of the tools um, I would recommend to include uh, in uh, assessment. Uh, another challenge I noticed is actually students, um, cultural wise, uh, what is students ready for? What type of assessments, what type of feedback are they ready to uh, accept? Um, Chinese teachers uh, tend to be, um, some teachers are too kind. Uh, they don't give a lot of, um, um, how do you say, firm uh, feedback or, um, uh, they, they tend to be too, too kind. There is another type of Chinese teacher. Uh, they are too strict. Uh, so <laughs> it's uh, uh, culturally, um, actually uh, uh, teachers need to be more sensitive, more uh, need to be um, understanding the students' needs when they are giving feedback or even designing the assessments. Uh, at this level, what is the purpose uh, of this course? Uh, why do students uh, learning in the online environment? What do they want to achieve? Uh, so it goes back to uh, what Gao mentioned, the alignment between what we value and what we want to achieve and also what students want to uh, take away from the learning process. So I think um, these are the two observations I have. You brought up a very important point, and it's something that I sometimes struggle with as an educator. There is the need to be kind and give students the positive feedback, but when there is an issue, when something needs to be addressed, we also need to make sure that we're addressing the problem, but also not being too strict or too harsh. So there really is that balance, and I think in the online world, 
where they can't see us face to face. Whenever they're reading our feedback, my students can't tell the tone of my voice. They can't see my facial expressions. So it's kind of important that we have to convey this message that feedback is all about growth and improvement. And we appreciate the work that you're putting forth. Here's what you're doing well, but then let's work together on these areas. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. It's a very important topic in online education. Thank you for that. And we'll pass the question to Wang Laoshi. Again, the question is about when providing feedback in the online environment, how do you essentially address the, the complications, I guess some of the challenges with Mandarin Chinese with your students? And if you can talk a little bit about how you bridge that gap with technology, I would love to hear a little bit about that too. Okay, okay. excellent question. Um, so there are, you know, the variations and the complexity of the language, including like a different written formats and dialects. Uh, for example, we have students uh, whose parents are from mainland China. There's heritage students who are up in Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and then plus we have students who just have a no background uh, in speaking Mandarin Chinese. And students, you know, have exposures to simplified format versus traditional Chinese. Uh, they may speak Cantonese at home versus Mandarin. Uh, there are many different, uh, you know, dialects and accents in China itself, and Mandarin is just a one of them. So for English speakers studying Chinese, it is hard for them to tell the difference. Uh, when our students study abroad in so southern provinces in China, they often get confused due to the differences between local dialects and Mandarin Chinese taught at school. So they may have questions, you know, the question themselves, uh, uh, on site and think, oh, is my Chinese good enough? Um, my Chinese is not standard without knowing. Uh, the, actually, the people there are speaking a dialect, like not Mandarin Chinese, right? So some of the, our students are heritage speakers and the parents may have taught them traditional Chinese at home. However, at school, they may be taught like simplified Chinese instead. And some schools may teach both simplified and traditional Chinese like BYU they, they does. Uh, for beginners, that may cause a lot of confusion uh, if they really have no prior knowledge about, you know, the format. Uh, so when I design the assessment, I have to consider a lot of factors that do not exist in other languages, which may affect student performance on the test. So can students read a test question in simplified Chinese? If they are a transfer student uh, from a different school district, that's like teaching one format and our school district uh, um, does not. And can those transfer students from like an international school, like in a certain area like Singapore or, you know, mainland or Taiwan, are they fluent in PE, you know, to type, you know, if it's an online, you know, exam, can they type in PE, can they uh, type simplified or can they type uh, traditional can I read the test instructions? Um, so should I include both the pinyin and simplified Chinese in my test, uh, especially for like an intermediate above level, you know, Chinese classes? So uh, when I design online quizzes, I said, you know, expected that, you know, a test outcome include uh, instructions that are crawling late. Um, so for example, if I wanted the, the goal is to test uh, how well students studied assigned, you know, vocabularies for this week, um, so I just, uh, you know, want them to know, like, um, I studied this, uh, let's say 20 uh, word caps, and I, I know uh, the meaning of them so I can match, you know, the Chinese with the English. I probably would include both the PE and the, the simplified, or if I have a student from, um, you know, a background that involves traditional characters, I will put a different formats so that all the students can read it because the goal is to test how well um, they master, you know, the vocabulary to understand the basic meaning. Um, so the goal is not to distinguish from one version to the other. I would put instructions in different formats to help them um, understand the questions. Uh, also, you know, I would uh, uh, let them know the tools before the test that they could use to study for the test. For example, they can download certain apps um, and use a certain website to facilitate their study. So. Those are all excellent ways to help bridge the gaps. And, you know, thinking about all the dialects and, and nuances of Mandarin Chinese and, and just different dialects in general, 
you know, that's really a lot to think about and it does kind of bring extra layers into it. But I love how you're using technology to essentially kind of differentiate maybe the instruction, but also the assessment as well, if needed. And I think the the key takeaway that I'm taking from all of this is that we really need to stay focused on what's important to assess, not necessarily the nuance of how are we assessing it and how do I ask this question? It's more what do we value and making sure that we're assessing the right things. So great discussion on that one. Thank you for that. Moving a little bit more into feedback, because that is a very important concept in general whenever we're dealing with students in that online environment. They need that feedback to grow. So from your perspectives as an online Chinese instructor, Mandarin Chinese instructors, um, Peng Laoshi, let's start with you on this one, please. And this is, again, talking more about feedback. But whenever you are providing that feedback in an online environment, how do you give feedback to students that is going to benefit them? Um, how do you give them the feedback that's going to help them grow, especially for their student that maybe is struggling with Mandarin Chinese? And how do you make that feedback effective for them? Mm -hmm. uh, the, to make the feedback effective for them and also, also for the teacher is equally important. So uh, when I give feedback, it's usually um, probably three kinds of feedback. The first one is um, after grading or after going over all the exercises or uh, the uh, projects of students. Then I find some of the common, uh, for example, areas that they need to improve. So I will probably record a tutorial for uh, uh, um, three to five minutes. Uh, that's, um, uh, that's some of the common issues I notice. So that's a, that's a quick uh, tutorial. And then uh, number two, uh, for individual students, I provide two types of feedback. One is pedagogically, um, I usually uh, control myself in making sure I only provide comprehensible feedback that is um, really essential to the uh, growth of the students at this, um, at this point. Um, and then not overwhelm them with uh, the types of uh, uh, corrections or uh, improvements they need. So I limit it to two to three points uh, language in their language use. It may have to do with uh, accuracy or the fluency, or it may have to do with uh, sometimes prosody or you know sentence um, uh, uh, parsing where where the pause and so on and so forth. Um, the last type of feedback is also individualized uh, feedback. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to students' emotional uh, support. Uh, how does, when I grade the students' uh, work uh, based on our interaction in the synchronous uh, meetings, um, what did I observe? Um, what do I, uh, you know, what are the behaviors of the students? Um, if uh, the, a student is uh, not paying attention or they are lagging behind, or sometimes they miss uh, the online meetings. So I'll probably ask, uh, uh, provide them more emotional support uh, as uh, appropriate. So these are the three types of feedback. And all three essentially are important. It, the shift that I've noticed, especially since the pandemic, is there is that importance of caring for the whole student and making sure that they know that if they're coming to these live sessions, this is a place where they're expected that they're not going to be perfect. And this is all about growth. So making sure that they know that they're welcome and it's okay if they make mistakes. I love that you mentioned the idea of making a quick tutorial video that really summarizes what are the common things that I'm seeing that students are struggling with. And that can be a game changer. I've noticed that whenever I have put these wrap up videos at the end, especially addressing areas where students are struggling, when we're moving to the next lesson, I'm not seeing so much of those same patterns repeating over and over again. They're making the same mistakes. And that's great to see other people have implemented that. I found that that has been very helpful. So thank you for sharing that. That's all really good feedback. And of course, giving that individual feedback too for the students so they can grow. I, I like thinking about it as three different types of feedback. Great examples. Thank you. We'll pass to Wang Laoshi again, the same question, and this is dealing with providing feedback to our students in the Mandarin Chinese courses in that online environment. So how do you provide the feedback that they need in order to grow, and how do you also more specifically help the students who might be struggling with Mandarin Chinese? Okay, very good. Um, so for, for example, you know, like, uh, um, uh, 
uh, for speaking kind of a, a you know practice that I you you know assess you know on a weekly basis a video project. So um, after you know kind of studying the materials, you're expected to write a video script and then record themselves and put together a short movie. Um, as assessment, and each student is asked you to use like a ten new words and a grammar patterns to write a movie script and then film it. Uh, I put it into the website that we use. It's called nowswimmingfish.com, and they have uh, you know four different levels uh, for Mandarin Chinese study, and they can study at home. So um, for my class, I use a flip the model. So they study the content for beginning level. They will study you know conversation topic. Let's say this week we study uh, ordering food from a restaurant. And then they have the list of, you know, uh, work tabs, the list of uh, all the possible sentences you can use. And it's an audio book, so you can access it on a tablet, on a phone, on a computer, different format. Um, and after they study it, um, at the end, you know, of each unit, each web page, it lists, you know, a simple question that um, asks them to put together a dialogue and a monologue. So they're using like a 10 or 15 new words they learn from the topic. Um, so they can follow that instruction. And then I give them the, the detailed the grading rubric. So they know exactly uh, the expectation and they can also do a self-evaluation before turning in their final work uh, on our uh, CMS system, which we use uh, e-learning. Uh, when I grade their final draft, I use the rubric to assess student pronunciation, fluency, confidence, speech flow, cultural appropriateness, uh, using the language and the creativity. Um, so to address students' need, I give a very detailed and individualized feedback according to the problems of the student video and script. So each student know exactly what they did well, which you know areas I would mark, you know, let's see, um, pronunciation is good, you know, uh, but you need to work on fluency, it's too choppy. So I'll tell them exactly, you know, which part of the video that they do well and which part they didn't do well that they needed to do and what they need to do to improve. Uh, and those are feedbacks are very individual. Uh, for example, a student may struggle pronunciation like falling, rising tone, I would put, you know, uh, well, or all your speech flow is good, you know, I can understand it, but your tones are kind of rough. Uh, I'll pick, you know, the mispronunciations from the video and send my correction telling the student a few tips to practice. In future, for example, you need to go back to the nowspinfish.com and on which web page and they listed, you know, the correct pronunciation and you click on that video clip and just listen to it a couple of times and then record it back to me and to show, you know, um, your improvement. Or if you have questions, you can also record back to me and uh, ask me for more, you know, feedback. So that way that, you know, or um, during on the on the road that they can uh, make a progress. So, um, and uh, I also uh, sometimes so occasionally if they couldn't, you know, figure out that I will record myself and how, you know, like uh, this is how you need to demonstrate how they should say it. If they after listening to the audio clips online and they tried their own effort and still couldn't figure it out, I would, uh, you know, demonstrate how to how to do that. Excellent. And I really like how the online environment is so conducive for going back and revisiting because it does take you, I'm sure, a fair amount of time to go back and record things for students. But then once you've done that, they have it. So they don't have to keep going back to you and saying, Wong Lao Xia, I still can't say this word correctly. Can you please say it over and over again? Well, they can just go back and revisit that recording. So I, I do love that aspect of being online with students. I also like how you mentioned the rubrics and kind of having students do a little bit of a self-assessment. I, I love the idea of having students take a look at what they're submitting and doing their own self-assessment, seeing where they're at, looking at what the expectations are, making them very clear to students, and then having them look at their submissions and say, okay, here's where I'm at. Am I meeting all of these criteria and making adjustments as needed rather than having to submit something, hope that it's correct, and ultimately maybe having not quite the expectation they were hoping for for their grade. So I really do like the idea of having that self-assessment. Thank you for that. And Kaslo Shu, we'll go ahead and pass it to you. 
And the question, again, same question, whenever you are providing feedback in that online environment, how do you provide students with the feedback they need to continue to grow? And also, if you have a student who's particularly struggling with something, how do you address that in online feedback? Sure, that's those are good questions and, and big questions too. I think feedback is one of those things that everybody everybody does and often assumes will work and it doesn't work the way we think it will and then we're frustrated by it but we don't we don't we're not thinking critically enough about it i think there's two things about feedback that are, that are really important for teachers to remember the first one is just because you give it doesn't mean they're going to take it and you know i have had colleagues for years and years and years who you know take a stack of papers home and they put all these marks all over it and they invest hours and hours and hours and hours of their life and then their students don't look at it and they feel really frustrated as one might expect um sort of not understanding why their students are not engaging with the feedback and then you get the converse on the other side you get sometimes where teachers know they're not going to give detailed feedback on every single thing that students do because that's not possible but students have these expectations that you know if i do something you should put a grade on it you should put feedback on it you should talk to me about it which like on the scale of one student is possible but on the scale of multiple classes multiple levels every single day is just not practical so one of the first important things about feedback is to have a good sort of plan for how you're going to do feedback and to communicate that to the other people involved, whether that's students, parents, if you're a team of language teachers to have some consensus among your department or your program so that you're giving kind of a unified message around when we give feedback, why we give feedback, how we give feedback, so that there's not sort of this disparity of work between colleagues. But I think feedback at its core, there's a quote by a, an assessment expert in education named Dylan William, who I which I really, really like, which is the purpose of feedback is it should lead to its own redundancy. In other words, you're giving people feedback, not so that they rely on you giving them feedback all the time, but so that they know how to do the thing they're trying to do better so that they can do it better by themselves. The point is that feedback leads you to learning, which will improve your performance so that you can do it independently and so that you can self-monitor, right? That you're, a, like we like to say in fancy terms, a self-regulated learner. So I think the more you can share the burden of the feedback, you can train your learners age appropriately and level appropriately to do things like self-assess, uh, peer assess, to give feedback to the entire class, not always to individual students on every single individual thing that they do. The more you share that capacity building for becoming self-regulated. And I think that's really important. And on, on top of that, I think I guess the way that I think about feedback is it sort of has six traits that I think make it effective. And I'll share a link there in the chat so teachers don't have to remember this forever. But the first thing is that the feedback is desired. If the person receiving the feedback doesn't want it, then it doesn't matter that you gave it, they're not going to engage. So if they don't trust you, if they are, if they are not looking for your feedback, you giving it is a waste of time because they're not going to want it anyway. So one thing sounds really simple that I started doing with my students was asking them, did they want feedback on this particular assignment? And often you'd get students who knew that they stayed up really late the night before and they sped through the assignment right before class just to get it done. And they knew it wasn't a reflection of their best work. So they said, you know, not on this one. I'm good on this one. Versus there would be other times where I, I, get, I used to give students options. And I learned this from a, a colleague, Meredith White, um, give them the option to opt out. No feedback, please. You can give them the option just to say something that I did really well. You can give me the option of something that I did really well and something that I need to improve on, just one thing, right? Or you can you can like tear it up, like give me all the criticism in the world and I'll take it all, I'm ready for all of it. But giving students that sense of agency and that sense of choice, what I found is number one, you never get students consistently picking the same thing. So you don't get students who always say, no feedback, no feedback, no feedback. And you don't get students always saying, I want you to give me the most detailed feedback possible. Students make different choices. And I think that's a really nice way of ensuring that the feedback is desired, right? So that's the first thing. They have to want it. The second one is that it's timely, right? And in an online space, especially an asynchronous space, that can be challenging. Um, but as close as possible to when the event took place is going to make it more likely that they relate the feedback to the thing that it's 
about. Um, the feedback has to be comprehensible. And in that sense, I don't mean just linguistically comprehensible, but often metalinguistically comprehensible. We say things to students like, your prosody is wrong. They don't know what prosody means. You have to be really student friendly, not a linguist, not using this technical jargon. Textbooks are abysmal at this. They use really technical language and they tell students that they're that this is a particle. That doesn't mean anything to anybody who's not a, a linguist with a PhD. So making sure that what you tell students is understandable to them, that they know what you're saying and why you're saying it and what they're supposed to do with it. The next one is that it's actionable. In other words, I know what I'm supposed to do, right? You're saying your tones are wrong. That doesn't tell me anything. Telling me what to do, how to do something differently is the only way that I'm possibly going to make use of your feedback. Um, the next one is, do I have an opportunity to use it, right? It's, so we say, oh, students don't pay attention to feedback, but humans take the easiest path, right? We take the path of least resistance. So if there's no opportunity for me to apply the feedback, why should I read it? Right. What is, what is my motivation to engage with your feedback if I can't use it? If you say, well, you should have done this. I don't have a time machine. I can't go back in time and change that. I didn't do that. So unless you're going to give me another opportunity to do something similar. I'm not going to read that feedback. I'm not listening to you because I can't change it anyway. And then so you as a teacher want to make sure that you have the opportunity to apply it. And then when they have that opportunity, then you hold them accountable for having done it, right? And that can be as simple as what I do with my college students is I ask them, how did you use, what feedback, what recent feedback have did you use on this assessment or this task? Explain it to me. And that's a reflection question that they do post-assessment, right? Then they can say, well, you told me yesterday that I should use more connectors to perform more like an intermediate. And look, I used seven. And I go, wow, you you clearly read my feedback. You, you used it, right? But all of those things together, as important as each of those traits are, if, it, if the practice of giving feedback is not sustainable for you, the teacher, and the practice of getting and using the feedback is not sustainable for them, the student, none of this matters. It could be the best feedback in the world, and if you have 5,000 students and it takes you three hours every single day to give all of them feedback, which would be great for 5,000 students, probably actually, it's not going to happen. So you have to find the balance between what's ideal and what's realistic for you in terms of sustainability. And uh, a colleague of mine shared with me once this idea of four quarters feedback. So 25%. And these percentages are not like super scientific, but I think it's a nice way of thinking about sharing that burden of feedback. So 25% is me, the teacher, to individual students. In other words, 25% of the stuff you do in a semester, you can expect that I'll give you individual independent feedback on. 25% is I'm going to look at everybody's performance, their assessment, their formative assessment, their exit ticket, whatever, but I'm not going to give feedback to you as an individual person. I'm going to give feedback to the whole class. This is where we are. These are the things we're struggling with. This is what we're going to do about it. 25% is you giving feedback to a peer. And that requires a lot of scaffolding. But once you teach them how to do it, once you teach them what to look for, and in those spaces, I tend to have students only focus on the positives, right? I don't need you telling your peer you're bad at Chinese. I want you to be saying, wow, you use so many connector words and noticing the things that some that I can learn from my peer. And then 25% is yourself, it's self, it's reflection, it's self-assessment, it's taking the rubric that Wang also just mentioned and grading myself on one band of the rubric or on the entire rubric. And it's taking, internalizing the idea of regulating your own learning and being sort of this community of learners because feedback is really hard. Everybody has lots of expectations around feedback. Students think they that you should be doing certain things. Your peers, your colleagues think you should be doing certain things. Parents think you should be doing certain things. Administrators think feedback works a certain way. And what we know, what both of the people here with PhDs in second language acquisition also know really well, is feedback is maybe the messiest piece of second language acquisition literature research that we have. We don't know much about feedback. We know basically in one sentence, some feedback works sometimes on some structures for some learners, which is kind of a useless thing to say. Right. So we don't have it all figured out, but it is it is a super important practice. We know that it matters. 
but balancing what's possible with what's necessary and ensuring that we maximize the opportunity for students to actually do something with it, I think is the only way that it's worth even thinking about. Well, that statement was really accurate. You know, the, we know that feedback sometimes works some of the times for something, and it's so accurate. It's just so accurate. I really like how you're giving us these, these guidelines to use and also the idea about kind of dividing the feedback into four quarters, but ultimately putting a significant amount of the ownership on the student to do that self-reflection giving themselves the feedback that they need to continue to improve and, and learning how to do that. Ultimately, we want to empower our students so that they feel that they're able to continue on with their studies and kind of dictate to themselves. These are the areas that I know that I'm struggling with. Let me focus here rather than the stuff that I'm already doing well on. That was fantastic. Thank you for that. That actually kind of is a really good segue into my next question. I think you address quite a lot of this, but the next question is about challenges. And asking generally, what are some of the biggest challenges with providing feedback for students whenever they're learning Mandarin Chinese and how you've overcome them? You know, you talked a lot about the specifics of the challenges. Maybe do you have some anecdotal stories you could share about how you've been able to help students that are struggling? Starting with me. Oh, yes, Sorry. that's just because it was kind of the perfect segue into that. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, just making sure. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think. Honestly, one of the best things you can do is just talk to your students. And and that sounds really simple and really intuitive. And everybody's like, duh, of course you talk to your students. But having conversations with them and seeing, getting a sense for what they think feedback is and why they think you're giving them feedback, even really simple things like to give you all an, uh, an example from, from the feedback research that we know, uh, one of the most effective kinds of feedback in oral communication is a recast, right? Which is when someone says something and they make some kind of error and you repeat it back to them without the error. So somebody says, the bottle is in the table and you say, oh, the bottle's on the table. You don't interrupt the flow of conversation. You don't say, you made a mistake. You don't say, whoa, error in, no, on, right? You don't interrupt anything. You just keep the conversation going. The problem is most humans perceive that as a confirmation, not as a correction. So you say, oh, they say the bottle's in the table and you say the bottle's on the table and they go, yep. And you're waiting for them to like have noticed that you said something different from them and they didn't notice. They're thinking you're just confirming the fact that they already told you. So one thing you can do that is really simple is training students to pay attention to look for that to notice that when you're repeating something that they said back to them, it's often because you're trying to help them be just a little bit better. And that you're not only doing it to them, you're doing it to their peers, right? So that they can be paying attention when you are interacting with them, but it's also gonna happen if they're interacting with more proficient speakers, right? So there's a little bit of sort of feedback literacy, we could call it, that you can build with your students the same way you can build some of those expectations around sort of, I'm not going to give you feedback on everything. And here's why, because it's not realistic. It's also not helpful, right? One of the most impactful sentences I got out of a teacher training a long time ago was teachability, right? The ability to teach something is constrained by learnability. So you can only teach what people can learn. And learnability is constrained by processability. So people can only learn what they can process, and you can only teach what people are ready to learn which is based on what they can process. If you overload them with too much feedback, you, it's as simple as asking them, repeat back to me what I just told you. They can't even remember what you just said, much less sort of incorporate seven different pieces of feedback into their next performance right away. So it's choosing that most important thing, right? That priority, I want you to get this, you got it. Okay, move on. Let's get the next thing, let's get the next thing. And, uh, I think we'll see a lot more steady growth on that kind of realistic path than if we overwhelm students with a bunch of stuff and they just shut down because it's it's too much to process that they can't handle it. Read completely. It is all about what the students are ready for. And again, we seem to keep looping back to the importance of that self-assessment, students being able to give themselves their own feedback, figuring out where they need to keep working. Thank you for that. That was fantastic. We'll go with the next question. This time we'll go ahead and pass to Wang Laoshi. And the question again is about feedback. 
And the question is, what are some of the biggest challenges of providing feedback for students in learning Mandarin Chinese and how do you overcome those challenges? Um, I think uh, tones uh, is a very uh, unique and, uh, um, you know, aspect and sometimes it causes a lot of difficulty for, you know, students, especially those from the English speaking uh, background. Um, uh, the Chinese is a tonal language. Uh, so in most cases, the mispronunciation does not affect native speakers' understanding of a non-native speaker. Uh, if a student simply uh, pronounce everything in its flat tone, uh, people understand them. It just sounds like a little robotic, like in the Star Wars, you know, robots, right? But they sound, you know, however, students don't have this awareness. Uh, beginners often think they must pronounce all four tones accurately from day one so they can be understood. That may cause a lot of anxiety and stress to the students and may affect how they, you know, um, continue on learning Chinese. So to give a productive and a, a practical feedback, I need to know what the students co is concerned about and to address their questions accordingly. So therefore, my feedback in the first week is different in the middle of the semester, even when I address the, you know, the same questions, as my expectation may be different. And the stage of students' learning and performance and their needs may change over time. So at the beginning, I will reduce you know, their stress and the burden by telling them uh, if you, you, know, you pronounce uh, the initials and the finals correctly, you know, you, you, after you study you know, the audiobook, uh, the PIN page on the website, and I think that that's a victory, you know, for day one. And so great. And you will get an A for, you know, uh, this day, right? I'll give them a, you know, an a, even though the tones may not be totally accurate and they may introduce some like the accent, it depends on if they're English speakers and Spanish speakers, they may pronounce, you know, like a certain um, PE differently. Um, but as long as they are kind of, um, on the right track, and I'll give you a, an okay. Uh, you know, I just said the goals as uh, communicable. So if I can understand it uh, as a native speaker, that's great. And doesn't have to expect you to be like a native speaker, like a native speaker from day one, right, or week one. Um, so instead of, uh, you know, accuracy at the native level. So however, in the, you know, midterm, uh, I expect them to hold a fluent conversation by mastering the vocabulary expressions of 10 basic conversation topics. So that's a little higher kind of standard. And it's a little broader, right, uh, what I assess. Uh, by the end of the semester, I expect them to perform fluency and accuracy in pronunciation, yet paragraph length kind of speech. Uh, so the basic rubric does not really change. So, uh, you know, like uh, the expectations are you need to do, uh, these are the, you know, the categories, right? The fluency, you know, um, the you know, appropriateness, you have to be confident and, you, have to, you know, the speech flow has to be good. You know, there are different categories that you know that has never changed. It's like, you know, across the semesters, <laughs> you know, the same. But however, how I enforce the rubric and how I evaluate their performance change and how I instructed them, you know, to make progress change. So students know that from day one, even though the uh, expectations uh, may be a little high, but they also know that they have a whole semester to work on it instead of, you know, uh, stressing themselves out, you know, thinking, oh, I can never do this. Um, so that's how, how I kind of address, you know, this question. It is, again, really important to make sure that we as educators are even assessing the right things and then giving feedback on what we're really trying to assess. And there is sort of a filter we kind of have to put our, I think sometimes, at least I can certainly vouch, so sometimes whenever I am grading a paper and I see a student who's particularly struggling, sometimes I have that natural instinct to just go crazy with the pen and give the framework of, you know, this is all just trying to help you. But, you know, it, it takes time, as you said, in day one, you're going to have different expectations than you will versus the middle of the semester versus the end of the semester. So there is kind of that that need to take all those things into consideration and factor all of that in whenever we're giving feedback. So these are all excellent points, good things to think about. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pass the next question. It's the same question actually to Peng Laoshi. And again, this is about feedback. What are some of the biggest challenges you find whenever you're providing feedback to your students who are learning Mandarin Chinese and how do you overcome those challenges in this online environment? Uh, yes, so uh, there are two biggest um, challenges I uh, realize in providing feedback. One is effectiveness. 
we have limited time and energy and the attention. So not only from the teacher's perspective, but also from the students. So how, how much time can we allocate for providing feedback for individual students or to the class? And then how much attention students will give to our feedback? So uh, that's the first challenge, um, the effectiveness. So I really like what uh, Galosh mentioned. Uh, I did it in a certain way, but I didn't think it in the quadrum, you know, 25% from the teacher to individual students, to the uh, whole class, and then to uh, peer, um, peer feedback or students' uh, self-reflection. Uh, I think maybe in the uh, upcoming semester, I'll do it more systematically. So that's a, that's something new I learned today. Uh, I think that's a, that may address this or one of the uh, ways to address this challenge uh, of limited uh, resources. Uh, another challenge I noticed is actually um, the difference. Uh, students at different proficiency level need different types of feedback. Uh, so Wang Laoshi mentioned uh, quite a bit uh, at the uh, beginning students in their tones or uh, earlier we talked about the writing, right? So um, are they writing in characters or are they typewriting? So uh, the type of feedback we provide to students also makes a difference. At the intermediate level, so um, what I uh, noticed is students at the um, beginning level, uh, they need a lot of encouragement to maintain a high level of motivation to continue the journey of learning Chinese. Uh, for students at the intermediate level or from intermediate level to advanced level, they need different types of uh, feedback. Uh, it may have to do with learning strategies, uh, may have to do with metacognitive uh, strategies or even the mindset. So um, to students, um, especially uh, I, um, I, I teach uh, advanced level classes uh, in the past uh, uh, few years. So I know this students, in order to uh, encourage students to seek the greatness to achieve superior level proficiency, sometimes they need some advisement um, on how to become a independent learner. So that involves a different type of feedback we provide students. So um, usually I, uh, give students a 45 minute or long or sometimes um, one hour long uh, language advisement session. So that involves the conversation, you know, the uh, deep understanding where they are, how they study, and even sometimes have them study next to me and as observe how they do an exercise or how they read an article or how they uh, watch a video and come, come up with their uh, summaries, for example. Uh, and then when you sit side by side with the students, you are able to notice more. You are able to um, combining with their, you know, that their work or their uh, performance in class, you're able to provide that in-depth uh, feedback they need for the next level of progress. So that's another way to deal with students' needs at different proficiency levels. Wow, and that is just so, the idea that I'm really hearing ringing through from everyone is that there is that importance of teaching students through feedback to self-assess. And even though you are investing a significant amount of time to sit with students as they study, you're quite literally, the, the old saying is teach a man to fish and he'll eat forever versus just giving a man to fish. You are teaching your students to fish. You're teaching them how to learn. And they can take that knowledge and apply that to those more advanced studies where they really might need the support. But now that they know what they're doing, now that they understand fishing, so to speak, and we're learning essentially, now that they know what to do, they can tackle those more advanced questions. I absolutely love that philosophy and that idea. Thank you for sharing that with us. And Ling Laoshi posted a question back to Kaz Laoshi asking, when you get a chance, can you please elaborate a little bit more on the four quarter feedback approach? Um, if you have a few moments, if we could talk a little bit more about that four quarter approach, I, I really do like that idea and that framework. That's something I think that we could maybe all implement into our school year coming up going forward, if you have a moment. Sure. Yeah. So the basic idea really is just to, there's no sort of set way to do it. In other words, it's not like four in sequence, like you look through the list of 
formative and summative assessments you're going to do and you say okay this one's one two three four one two three four one two three four like that that's not the idea and this is and that the four quarters the percentages again is not sort of an exact science you must do exactly 25 percent in this way the idea instead is to look through your assessments and i find it really helpful actually to like map out the assessments that i'm going to be giving across an entire semester just on like a large piece of chart paper. I actually do it with sticky notes because then I can move them around. Uh, but just to have my like 15 week semester, what kinds of summative assessments am I gonna be doing? What kinds of formative assessments am I gonna be doing? What are sort of, I heard what I also mentioned, what are sort of the quizzes? What are things that are kind of smaller than quizzes? What are things that are bigger, like uh, unit level performance assessments? If I have a midterm exam or final exam, if that's a thing in my context, fine putting them all there. And once you have this map to get a sense of sort of how many times you're assessing your students a little more formally, because actually the secret is we're assessing our students all day, every day, basically everything we do is an assessment, but formal assessment we'll say is looking at those and deciding which ones do I plan to give each individual student feedback for and why? Why do I think this assessment deserves individual feedback? Is it because it's the students have invested a lot of time? It's something like a project. So it really does need that teacher to student sort of individual feedback. Is it that I'm going to across the board say all of my unit level summative assessments will be individual feedback from me to the students? And remember that individual feedback doesn't mean that you have to do different things for every student automatic feedback, right? Like if you are having them watch a video and answer some multiple choice questions, that's individual feedback because everybody gets different feedback, right? It doesn't have to be that you write them, you know, 500 word explanation of what you think they did well and they didn't. In fact, I've, I actually have a colleague in the Boston area who he started just collecting sentences that he found himself saying or typing to different students over and over and over again. And he made himself almost like a feedback bank that in his first year doing it, it was a lot of work, right? To like grab these different sentences and kind of compile these lists to say on interpersonal assessments, I seem to keep saying these things. On presentational writing assessments, I keep saying those things. But after he did it year one, it became really fast to give feedback because he could grab those relevant recurring sort of comments and not type them from scratch over and over again. So the idea is just to look at your assessments and say, which ones do I want or need to give one-on-one -on -one feedback for? Which ones can I just give feedback to the whole class for? And there are some nice frameworks to do that, some different possibilities there. Which ones can I train students because it does take training to give feedback to their peers on. So that might look like the students listen to a performance by a peer, or they read something that a peer wrote, or they watch a video that a peer made, something like that, right? You have to think about what's the thing that they're gonna give feedback on, and which ones can they give self-assessed feedback on, and what does that look like, right? Are you gonna make a self-assessment, like a Google form that they press, you know, I usually do, I can't do this yet, I can do this with help. I can do this independently, right? They have kind of these three choices for each of the things that they're self-assessing on. Is it that you're using a rubric that they already know how to use, right? So it really is just about planning in advance how you're gonna give feedback. We always have an assessment plan, but we don't usually have a feedback plan. And I think that's where we end up, like Paul was just talking about, we spend a lot of our time because we're not thinking carefully about it in advance. We just think, oh, I'm building them up. I'm doing all this teaching planning, right? I put the assessment there, backward design all the way through the unit, and I'm teaching towards this really nicely designed assessment. But I never actually thought, what am I gonna do when I get to the assessment? What am I gonna do post-assessment? And because we don't plan for that, then we typically don't ensure that our students are going to use the feedback. And there sort of is this disconnect, right? We have this really nice buildup all the way to the assessment, and then it kind of falls flat. And then we do another unit and it kind of falls flat. And there's not this connected sense that the students are bringing stuff with them from unit to unit and feedback kind of being that link. So what it boils down to for me, whether you like 25%, fine, 50%, fine, 30%, it doesn't matter. The point really, I think, is to think and to plan 
to have sort of a feedback plan when you have an assessment plan. And then that feedback is not only how will I give it, but if you have a really nice feedback plan, it's how will they use it? So I, I'm going to give individual feedback and then I'm going to give all my students an opportunity to revise their essay, for example. Because if you say, I'm going to spend all this time giving individual feedback, and then I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that the students use it, they won't. So you have, so it's planning these things really intentionally, I think is, is the goal. And it, it, to be honest, is something I'm still really working on in my own practice. It's really hard to plan for all of these things because it feels like a lot of work up front. But I'm finding that if I plan for it, I'm much more likely to save myself a lot of work throughout the semester and not be giving individual feedback on everything because I can't. Otherwise, I stay up till 3 a.m. every day and that's not healthy. Yeah, definitely not healthy. And I would agree that there's definitely that uh, medium where we kind of have to be diligent about are we working hard or are we working smart? You made a comment about the uh, colleague that you have up in Boston that was saving the feedback. I do this. And I actually use this with a text expander tool, and I am so well trained now. I'm at the point where I can key in characters that to other people look like random shorthand, but it will come up with an entire blurb and point them to a resource, a link. To, and I maybe I made it or it's something that somebody already made, but this explains what's going on with that it. So good. it's been a huge time saver. And I love that the students are able to get that instant feedback from me and that they can go out to whatever website and they can see more in detail what's going on. This is fantastic. And I think that's kind of the perfect uh, segue into our break. I actually mentioned backward design. We're going to talk a little bit more about assessment in our next segment. So I have two minutes after the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. Go ahead and come back at maybe seven minutes after the hour. And we'll go ahead and get into our second part of the discussion. And again, thank you all so much for being part of this. We'll see you all back here at seven minutes after the hour. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I think this is a good segue. We were talking a little bit about backwards design, actually, in our last segment at the tail end. And I actually want to start there. Backward design is a concept that we think about a lot in assessment because we want to make sure that our assessments are truly designed so that they are assessing what we want our students to take with them, what we want them to be able to do by the time they've finished our content and done the exercises they need to move on to their next level. So I want to go ahead and start with Peng Laoshi. And that question is, why is backward design so important for Mandarin Chinese assessment in the online environment? Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, backward design is uh, very important uh, because uh, it's, it's the same uh, reason we have limited resources of attention, of time, of energy. So um, we can teach students uh, 100 Chinese characters, for example, uh, every week, but they are not going to remember all of them. And actually for what we need them to do at the end of the week, uh, may not, it, it may not be necessary for them to know, uh, to um, memorize by heart how to recognize them or write them uh, by the end of the week. Um, so I think that's, that's the key reason why it is important to, you know, really to think what is the outcome, uh, what is the final product or what is the uh, performance, what is the proficiency goal of this course, of this um, uh, um, of, of this semester, and um, you, uh, when you have when the teacher intentionally put that into the design, and that's the first things they consider, then they will be able to go back and then think, okay, when I design all the learning activities, when I design all the um, uh, how do you say assignments, uh, I will be selected. So what I include in the instruction, these are the words, uh, uh, these are the things that would, uh, functions I would like you to practice uh, in finishing this task or this activity. It all ties up uh, together uh, towards the final goal. So I think um, it will help us to uh, give students a better uh, learning experience. Uh, it will help students to um, grow uh, um, more how to say, in a more acceptable, uh, uh, how to say, it, uh, in terms of uh, how, they, how they see uh, is the, is, uh, is the uh, ideal, uh, optimal use of their time and energy. 
Definitely. Those are all important things to think about. And truly, again, I'm hearing this theme about we have to really focus on what we want the students to accomplish. What is the goal of this lesson? And if we're starting with that, starting with that backward design, I think we're going to be a lot more likely to get there versus just throwing content at them and hoping that the assessment reflects that. Thank you for that. Wang Laoshu, I'll pass the question to you. And again, the question is about assessment. And why is backward design so important for the online assessments of Mandarin Chinese in the online world? Um, I find the uh, personally backward design very helpful and important uh, to ensure designing a su su successful assessment. Uh, so backward design tells you the expected learning outcome and helps you to set a goal before even starting you know, the design process. Uh, let's say I want to uh, you know, design a test to assess student fluency in conduct conducting a self-introduction in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, with that goal in mind, um, I can you know, select and design meaningful test questions and reading rubrics and to assess you know, fluency. Uh, in class, uh, I can design activities and a task to help students master the grammar patterns, the vocabulary, certain expressions and language points and to help students reach that goal. Um, so in practice, I conduct like say a one-on-one -on -one test to evaluate student fluency in speaking. A student may know their pronunciation is not accurate in that process, but they don't know how to improve it. So as an instructor and a curriculum designer, I need to I need to know students' concern and how I can uh, design a test to diagnose the problem accurately and um, their proficiency levels. And if a student does not do well in pronunciation, I can demonstrate how they speak it in comparison to how the native speakers speak it. And I find that's very important because sometimes students find it most helpful when they hear me imitate their mispronunciation um, instead of just like, uh, this is the ideal example, right? Um, this is actually how you speak it. Uh, and such so uh, they can compare, you know, how they speak it by hearing I, you know, imitate their mispronunciation versus the standard, you know, perfect audio clip. Uh, so they understand their problem. So from there, I need to tell um, uh, that, you know, this is, is this student how to improve it uh, through personal like a kind of uh, strategies. Uh, so each student is different. Sometimes it is affected by their phonological awareness and some other times it's due to their hearing problems and um, their certain pronunciation habits. For example, some students, you know, are, you know, kind of a hard struggling speaking English and that, you know, L1, you know, ability affected their L2 study. So, um, so the, they, they, from there, you know, I kind of understand, you know, who my students are. Um, and with backward design, I have kind of collect all those factors and then kind of weigh which one is important. And when I design a test, I can address, you know, those issues more accurately. That's a good point. And just being aware as to where your students are and if there are particular things that might need to be addressed, if we can put that in the assessment up front. I think we're a lot more likely to go back and say, okay, these are the things that I need to make sure that I'm covering so my students are progressing. So that's a really good point. Thank you for that. I do love how online instruction really lends itself to differentiation. Kas Laoshu, passing the question to you. And again, it is why is backward design important for Mandarin Chinese assessment? So I definitely echo what Palanch just said about, you know, we have limited time, limited resources. And so we have to prioritize, right? And and then what Wang also just said about, you know, knowing where your students are and where you want them to go and what that gap looks like. So you know how to structure instruction, right? The sort of the most important thing I think with teaching is you teach from where your students are. There's no like, well, you should know this. The thing is, if they don't know it, they don't know it. So you telling them they should know it is harming them and harming you and not actually helping anybody. Um, Backward design, the way I think about it is it's like good GPS. If you want to go somewhere you've never gone before, do you start driving and hope you make it and hope you get there eventually and you don't care how much time you waste? Or do you want to get there in the most efficient way possible so you start by setting the destination and then you get on the road? I think there's a clear answer there. And particularly when it comes to online teaching, but perhaps teaching again in general, um, I think the majority of the work that we do as teachers is before class starts. 
it's like the saying in Chinese that I shared on uh, whatever day that was Wednesday, I think, you know, you spend 10 years off the stage for one minute on the stage. The idea is I can only design learning experiences and build my learning management system, set up these online tools that my students are going to use, this sort of pathway for them to go through if I know where they are right now and where I want them to be. And not only does that matter sort of course internally, right? If you're teaching a class and you sort of are structuring your units so that they're going to move to being able to perform consistently at the intermediate low level, let's say, um, then you're going to be structuring sort of the internal design of each of your courses and each day, you know, each unit, each class. But that also happens at scale. It's one of the things like Peng Lao Shi, for example, I'm sure at in a flagship program that's designed by definition to get students to achieve a certain level of proficiency by the end, that doesn't happen by magic. It happens by planning, right? So knowing that if I have four years, five years to get students to this level of proficiency, where did what benchmarks do they have to hit in year one, year two, year three, and year four to make that realistic? And what are they actually achieving, right? What are they actually hitting? So I think backward design, it sounds really, it can sound overwhelming. And it, this idea of sort of how do you plan assessments before you plan teaching, right? I think it can be a little bit confusing when you first get exposed to the idea, but boiling it down to beginning with the end in mind, I think really is helpful if you think about it, you have to know where you're going before you get started going in that direction. Agreed. And I like how you talked about there is kind of that need to also look at the whole picture. If you are looking at an entire program, and let's say I have optimistically, I have a student that's going to stick with me all four years of say high school. Where are we starting them off looking at where they are? And then ultimately, where do they want to go? And what benchmarks do I need to hit in between there is definitely very, very important. So you kind of have to look at it from the micro level of this is unit five, lesson one, and we're going to cover topics of life in school in China. But we have to focus on that as well as the big picture to make sure that we're getting everything the students need to continue up that ladder of proficiency. Thank you for those thoughts. Fantastic. Uh, and let's go ahead to Wang Laoshi, starting with uh, the same question now. And this is about uh, backward design for, uh, or oh, wait, I'm sorry. I think we already, I already answered, you answered that. Yep. Okay. So I gotcha. This is actually kind of a, a fun question. And I, I realize I might be putting a little bit on the spot, uh, uh, Wang Laoshi, but if you could implement only one thing, for making your assessments in Mandarin Chinese online more robust and engaging for the students, what one thing would you implement? Um, I would put a, a very clear and step-by-step -step grading rubric because um, 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 th there's a several benefits of that. And the first is it gives students a very clear map of um, the expectation that if the, they do this, they're going to reach the high, highest level of uh, you know excellency. Um, that in uh, speaking, uh, you know, like uh, for example, fluency, their tones, their pronunciation, um, their speech flow. Um, so that all those uh, different aspects. So actually, you know, some students, you know, uh, have no no knowledge, prior knowledge of what they can expect. That this might be their first foreign language class, right? And they, they suddenly realized, okay, learning a language there actually for just speaking, there's a different categories that will be accept, assessed, right? Um, so that give you a, give them a clear map and a goal to work on. And then from there, you can tell, read the, the specific instructions. Oh, if I do this, I can reach this and I can get three points versus two points. Um, and some students may just, uh, you know, uh, sneak in the class expecting an easy A, or some other students may say, I just need a three credits to graduate, right? And uh, they don't want to spend too much time because they have an internship, they have, a, you know, final projects in their major classes. Um, so they just want to do the bare minimum. And then they can, from the rubric, to tell, okay, if I do this, I can pass this class so I can better, you know, do a time management. So the rubric has, you know, a, function uh, very well to help, you know, the the very highly motivated students who are having high expectation, like expecting to work at the corporations that they want, they actually have to use the language to conduct in you know, a business. 
um, to tell them what they specifically need to do and uh, what they do can reach what kind of level um, that breaks down into smaller steps for them to work on during the semester, but also helps you know those who just want to do the barely minimum to pass the class and to earn a, you know, a degree. So um, uh, if it was one thing I would include in my assessment, I would, uh, especially in the online format, I would put a, a rubric that when I grid it and I can click on, you know, like let's say category one and three points, two points, and then add a more detailed feedback below. And so each student felt like um, I there's a, some, uh, Standards you know, across all the you know, classes, but also they get more individual feedback and interaction with the instructor. I really like that idea of using the technology, using the ability within whatever learning management system you might be working with, if it has that functionality to display the rubric and show them in the visual representation. Here are the categories, here's where I placed you, and then giving that more individual feedback at the bottom, explaining a little bit about why I placed my students in each category. So that's a really good technique to use. Definitely very helpful, especially whenever students are working through and, and reviewing what did they do and how are they progressing. And I also liked how you mentioned with rubrics in general, how not all students are going to have the same goals and the same objectives for the course. And I think by setting those clear expectations of this is what needs to be done at each level to reach whatever level of, of proficiency, essentially, the students who are very driven and want to earn all the marks on the chart, those expectations are very clearly set out. Students who maybe just kind of need to get that three credits, hey, that's where you're at. And let me show you what our expectations are to get you there. So that way you're not spending too much time. And I think having those clear expectations too, that's going to make the class a little bit more accessible for the students. They're not going to feel frustrated that they have to read their professor's mind and figure out this is exactly what I need to be submitting. It's clear the expectations are written there for them. They can go back and reference it and do that self-assessment too before submitting it, doing that self-assessment saying, okay, here's the rubric. Where do I place myself right now and see if there's some areas where I might need to up my game a little bit. So I love that strategy. Thank you for sharing that with us. And passing that question to uh, Peng Laoshi, and this is again about uh, assessments. If you could implement only one thing into making your assessments and Mandarin Chinese a little bit more bust and more beneficial for the students, how would you do that in that online environment? Uh, yes, this is a great question. Um, I think I would do one thing that is to create more games, more interactive activities for a uh, formative assessment. So in, uh, I've done a lot uh, for summative assessments uh, and provide feedback very you know, detailed, sometimes uh, maybe too much feedback for summative assessment. Then I forget um, how, how students actually feel in the online learning environment. So one time uh, this uh, past uh, summer, uh, I designed a Kahoot. I thought, you know, nobody would like the Kahoot, but this is just one exercise. Um, you know, uh, we have some time. So I created this uh, Kahoot to check students' comprehension about uh, Taiwan culture. We are talking about uh, traveling to Taiwan. They watched uh, some uh, videos, uh, finished some of the uh, practices. So we have some extra time. So um, then, uh, I didn't know how engaged or how excited students immediately turned into because they are playing games with each other. So um, that, uh, you know, they, and then one of the students, uh, he was winning the whole time, but then he lost it uh, for, the, uh, for the last question. And then, so students, it, it changed the whole climate or the atmosphere of the class. So that reminded, uh, in retrospect, it reminded me that um, when we, when I'm designing activities to assess or to evaluate students' learning, I also need to make it more fun, you know, more more engaging uh, for students. To, um, it it's always I I think that's one thing I would make. Uh, it will make my uh, teaching more, more robust. 
um, that is to create uh, games like, um, you know, maybe Quizlet, may maybe um, Kahoot, maybe Jigsaw, maybe uh, other small group competition to bring students to create that community, to create that uh, experience for students, even though they are not physically together, but st they are still learning together with each other. So that's the one thing I would improve. I do like the idea of bringing gaming into the classroom. And you made a good point about how it does build community, even in that online classroom. They don't see each other face to face, but if they're all playing at the same time, there's that friendly sense of competition. The other thing that I've noticed too is that it seems to kind of lower the filters. Students seem a little bit less concerned about making a mistake and they're they're playing, they're having fun. So they might be giving a little more of an authentic answer versus kind of screening everything. Oh, is this right? Is this right? Well, no, they're just kind of giving you what they're initially thought, their, their initial thoughts essentially. So it's a little bit more authentic. So definitely a good way to keep it fun and engaging for the students. I like the idea of bringing gaming into the classroom in general. It really doesn't take a whole lot of planning necessarily. I'm not having to go in and write code about how to program a Kahoot. I'm basically taking the content I want to share with the students. That code part's already done for me. I'm just entering in the content I want them to practice with. So it makes it a lot more accessible to people like me who aren't necessarily computer programmers and coders, but I do want to have that fun interactive experience. Thank you for that. I'll show, go ahead and pass that question to you. If you could implement only one thing into making your assessments for Mandarin Chinese in your online classroom more robust and engaging for the students, how would you do that? What would you implement that one thing? Good question. And I think if I had to only pick one, I would choose to have computer adaptive assessment. And this is a technology that's like in development. Some of the major uh, language testing companies are sort of trying it out. But the idea basically, right, is that every time students do something, for example, if you give them a, an authentic text to read and there are some questions that accompany it, based on how well they do, the next text that they read will either be more difficult or less difficult. Or the, the text might stay the same, but the task might ratchet up or ratchet down in difficulty. And it's the idea of it being all computer adaptive is you don't have to click buttons and make those choices it will do it on its own based on sort of preset cutoffs. And in, in my dream world, you can do that for all the modes of communication. So there are, you know, the possibility for you give students a prompt and based on how they respond out loud or how they respond in writing, the next prompt will vary in difficulty or complexity or ask them to do different things. You know, I think we're closer and closer to this being a reality. It's still quite far away, technologically speaking. But I think um, AI chatbots, for example, are starting. There's one, oh, there's one that a friend showed me recently. I think it's called Quasal. I'm going to put it in the chat. I think that's how you spell it. It's not perfect. And for Chinese, actually, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit too formal, the way it talks. Its register is a little bit higher than sort of the normal everyday speech that you would do talking with a person, but it's nice. It's contextualized. It's responsive. It's actually multilingual. It's a really fascinating tool where you can either talk or write in a combination of English and Chinese, for example, and it will understand you no matter what and will respond. So there's some really interesting possibilities. I think we're going to go into the future that will incorporate some of these things we've been talking about in terms of meeting the students right there where they are, finding that balance of sort of challenge, but I can do this. And also feedback that's like, you're right here. So here's the next thing you need. If, you know, right now we teachers are sort of bearing a lot of the, the challenge of that. Uh, but I think something that's going to come along in the next, you know, 10 years, maybe is going to be really some nice tools that help us preset some computer adaptive levels that if the student does this well, put them here. And if they struggle there, maybe make it a little easier and we're going to maybe be able to manipulate that a little bit. And I think in an assessment space, that will be perfect because assessments at the end of the day, I think what it boils down to is the only reason to assess your students is because you want information, right? You want to know how well are they doing? How well have they learned the thing that I've taught? Where should they be in my program? Because they're brand new and I need to find the best placement for them. You're trying to get information. 
So the idea of making an assessment easier or harder for a student to some teachers, that's like, no, you can't give students help on an assessment. And I disagree. I think the point is to figure out where they are, not to make them feel bad. So if you figure out that they're lower than you expected and they can only do the thing with help, you've gotten the information that you want. And I think, I hope, computer tools are going to really help us sort of adapt to the individual needs of students a little bit better going forward. We'll see. Uh, I hope so, though. There's definitely a great possibility for some more of that individualized instruction if tools like AI are able to get in and really hone in at the level, where is the student at now? What do they need to just jump up that one extra notch just to keep growing? I, I see huge potential with that. And we actually got a great question from Jacob Lausch that just came into the chat. And that kind of is a little bit of a, a piggyback question on what we were just talking about with uh, these assessments. But your thoughts on virtual reality meetings with avatars as a way of conducting a synchronous online Chinese class session, or do you think it's better to just use video conferencing like Zoom? It's a really neat idea, Jacob. And, you know, I, I personally do interactive sessions with Zoom, and they're actually, honestly, that is my favorite part of my job to this day. I love to get in and, and work with the students and, and play games and have fun. But um I personally can't say I've used any type of an interactive uh, avatar meeting type of a thing. It's an interesting idea and not sure if any of you have any experience with that. Just thought I would throw the question out to the panel. Got some thoughts, not too much by way of experience yet. I think a big part of this, the challenge with, with VR tools is that they're still not super accessible. They're not, they're sort of useful for a very narrow thing. Like often, and I'm sure Paul Osher, Juan Osher know also, we see sometimes in research, people will say, you know, VR for language learning, but it's that somebody spent like thousands of dollars to develop this interactive scenario that you can only do once, right? Like you can interact with the thing, but it can't do anything beyond sort of, it's like a chatbot with a lot of limitations. Um, what it sounds like Jacob is talking about is sort of more, like these online meeting spaces that people are using that you can sort of walk up to somebody and interact with them briefly and then walk away and interact with someone else and kind of go in and out of virtual rooms. I think that has the potential for being really interesting, but I think it requires a lot of scaffolding so that you don't just get a lot of off-task behavior, basically. It would be my biggest concern is that in Zoom, we there sort of is a way for me to bring everybody back to this one central space and redirect or provide support or change the prompt if I realize things are not going well. And sort of I can like recall you from breakout rooms, for example. But for things like I know many of our college level colleagues do things like uh, Chinese corner or some equivalent where you have like this speaking group that meets like one hour a week. Um, I could see like sort of small group sessions in a space like that, especially if you had like facilitators, if you had some uh, heritage speakers or you had some L1 users who you were able to bring in as volunteers. I could definitely see potential in that space. I would I would think, number one, your students have to know the tech quite well. And number two, your students, you have to scaffold it well. And really, I think what it always boils down to with technology is pedagogy first, technology second, right? What is your goal? What do you want them to be able to do? And is this tool the only way or the best way to get that pedagogical goal to happen? Sometimes I think we do tech for the sake of tech. And then we're like, ooh, ChatGPT, let's use it. Sure, yes, let's use it. If it gives us the best pedagogical bang for our buck in this limited, limited time that we have with our students. Completely agree. And I can certainly vouch as a uh, person who's pursuing an ed tech uh, master's degree right now. There is definitely that balance of is it tech for the sake of tech or is it tech that can help us meet the objective? And if it's the former, let's steer away. If it's the latter, let's go for it. <laughs> definitely. Uh, Peng Lao Shu, Wang Lao Shu, any thoughts on the idea of having uh, these kind of avatars conducting synchronous session? If you've experienced anything like it or just have any thoughts on it? Um, I, I think that's a very creative, you know, question. Um, I've been 
spending about six years, you know, actually developing, you know, virtual reality kind of product for a company. Um, so I kind of have some experience involved in the design process of actual product versus, you know, teaching it in the classroom. So my perspective, uh, I think there are several things. The virtual reality is actually have a very good potential, you know, to replacing and to push, you know, the online learning into the next level. Um, the bottleneck here is not kind of educators might, you know, anticipate. And so first is the maturity of the technology. It's very complex. It's, it's much more complex in programming than uh, Zoom. Um, and also a, the, the supply chain, you know, um, you think about, uh, you know, the technology is not as accessible as a Zoom because students can use their phone, they can ha they have their laptop, they can go to a library. Not all the libraries have a virtual reality headset. So that hardware creates a really huge bottleneck. Um, I think until um, uh, Facebook, uh, which is, you know, um, the... Um, a few years ago, launched you know the uh, Oculus, you know from the Oculus Go to the uh, Oculus Quest, you know um, different versions of VR headset. They really try to reduce you know the cost of the headset to make more people uh, be able to afford you know using it. And even though there's a, just a way kind of a too many you know video games on it, and which is causing that business model itself causing difficulty for you know language kind of product to be. Uh, having their their foot in that you know uh, metaverse you know thing right um, so there are factors that maybe educators may uh, overlook on that and also I think um, the question um, is um, how how do you you know kind of use it effectively uh, there are factors for example students have dyslexia right and then they really think the reverse like you know virtual reality they will carry all those you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, think things, you know, these questions um, into the virtual world. Um, so teachers may, like, a, um, there's one semester I use the virtual reality and the student do have a, a, did have a dyslexia in the class. And until kind of middle of the semester, I didn't quite understand why he couldn't process the information, the videos in the VR uh, as effective as other students uh, until I figured out you know, that's his physical kind of disability and causing the difficulty. And also there's a, a high, higher percentage of students may uh, have experienced headache when they use virtual reality. So you, you actually cannot enforce and say require all the students to wear a headset. You know, sometimes 10 minutes would be really a maximum. So those are the kind of the factors, you know, uh, we kind of look into in the design process that actually affecting, you know, uh, to how, how, even though you have a very successful, you know, product, you can actually do a human robot interaction and really significantly reduce the teacher labor. Um, it also really kind of make, um, uh, recreate, you know, kind of an authentic environment. Uh, without having students study abroad, it has a huge kind of potential there. And uh, I, I totally believe that VR can, you know, push it to the next level. But the, the question, uh, like I mentioned, are things that maybe educators are not, you know, kind of really paying attention that actually causing difficulty for VR to be more successful at school levels. You brought up a lot of excellent points, especially about accessibility and student health or students physically able to interact with these types of technologies. So those are all things we'll really have to take into consideration as technology continues to grow and change our world. Thank you for that. Uh, Peng Lao Shi, any thoughts about uh, virtual reality meetings with these avatars as a way to conduct some synchronous online interaction with students? Uh, I think the other two panelists already make great points. Um, I can I agree with uh, Jacob and other teachers that you know virtual uh, technology or uh, VR or uh, AI have their advantages. Uh, they can make our classes more innovative and uh, creative. So, for example, we can even make a Halloween themed unit, um, you know, using avatars to interact with students in the virtual environment. Um, so, yeah, it goes back to you know the pedagogy logical driven uh, use of technology, right? The effectiveness and uh, the accessibility of the resources. So I don't have an additional point to make. They made a great uh, summary. 
it's just a lot of new things we'll really have to think about as educators as the technology continues to change our world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we did have another question come in. I'm interested in a, learning about the types of assessment that you use and finding them effective for listening and speaking. Um, if you have a few minutes, panelists, if we could maybe quickly cover that topic, maybe kind of at a high level. Uh, uh, if you'd like to go ahead and start, you give me a thumbs up there. So yes, I think you might have more to say. You know me well enough by now to know that uh, my response will be, what do you mean listening? What do you mean speaking, right? That the, the first point I think is always to clarify for who and what exactly is it that you have in mind? Are we talking about, you know, I think people get caught up sometimes with the national standards and say, you know, why can't I just say why can't I just say speaking, listening, reading and writing? Why do I have to say interpersonal and presentational and interpretive? But I think those distinctions are really valuable. I think differentiating, for example, between presentational speaking and interpersonal speaking is really going to help you think importantly about what do you want to assess exactly? What's the skill? What's a realistic expectation for this level of learner? And then to circle back to Jacob's question also, right? What technology tools can I leverage to achieve this assessment goal, right? So if you're talking about interpersonal speaking, uh, it's going to look very different than if you're talking about an assessment of presentational speaking. Although, all of that being said, one tool that I really like for both of them, whether it's interpersonal or presentational, is uh, Extempor, which I shared earlier in the chat and Jim so kindly uh, put a link to. It's a free tool, and I love it because they're committed to it being free and staying free. Um, and it's really good for what I would for like AP exam style, semi interpersonal speaking, sort of this prompt and response that's recorded. That's not exactly a live conversation, um, but what's really nice about it is whether you do it for presentational or interpersonal, you can record a prompt or multiple prompts. And it can be as simple at the novice level as, you know, what's your name? Where are you from? Tell me about your family. Tell me about your pets. What do you like to do on the weekends? It can be these really simple questions that they're going to respond to in one or two sentences, all the way up to, you know, those really high level classes that Peng Lao teaches that is like, you know, what's the most interesting feature of Taiwanese culture that you, that we've talked about and how do you find it different or similar to your cultural background, which would be a very high level sort of question to respond to in the target language, right? So um, there's lots of tools, there's lots of tasks, there's lots of prompts, and there's lots of rubrics out there in the world to consider, but it really boils down, I think, to thinking really specifically about what's the level of the students you're trying to assess and what's the specific skill and the objective. And once you have those things in mind, creating a task really is much easier than this sort of idea of, I'm looking for speaking assessment strategies, if that makes sense. It's a little bit very high level, but I think that's that would be my response. And it just goes to show how interconnected everything is and how we really have to be mindful of, is it really that you're focusing on this one area or are there other aspects and components we kind of need to factor in here? Excellent points. Uh, Pang Laoshi, Wang Laoshi, any thoughts on types of assessment that you use and find them effective, maybe for listening and speaking, but also other components as well? Uh, so I can give you... Uh, I think uh, uh, Matt uh, Gao should uh, give it a very high level, um, compre almost comprehensive answer to the question. So for example, why the task is important. If I'm just uh, evaluating students' um, presentational speaking, for example, uh, maybe a uh, read aloud exercise with either um, example, is it, is it called example rep? or I use Flipgrid. So, um, so that's another similar app um, to have students read, uh, read their uh, essay, for example, or read aloud a, uh, the main text or one paragraph and then give them feedback. So that's one type of form uh, formative assessment uh, for listening and the speaking exercise. So I use uh, Chairman Bao, I use uh, Pounder Reader, sometimes I, um, put uh, authentic materials into the app and have students finish the reading exercises or listening exercises. It may be a, a YouTube video. And then 
uh, for students that I teach at the intermediate high to advanced low level, one of the important skills uh, I practice is uh, for them to summarize the main idea of the video they watched or the reading they uh, just finished uh, the reading and then uh, summarize in their, in their own words. So that can be a um, task. And then I have them do pair work, listen to each other's responses. So that can be interpersonal too, if they're involved, that involves uh, negotiation of meaning or uh, some type of comparison or contrast or summary. So uh, it goes back to what um, Galosh mentioned, what's the purpose of the exercise? It's not, um, it, 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 it truly depends on the goal. Um, what do you want to achieve with this uh, assessment or that? the task. Yeah. And once again, that central theme of determining what is it exactly that we want to achieve shows up in this conversation. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Wang Lao Shi, any thoughts about uh, types of assessment that you use? Maybe you find more effective for listening or speaking. Um, I don't have anything to add. I think the other two panelists did a very really good job answering that question. Fantastic. This has been quite possibly one of the most robust and entertaining OLP series that I have ever had the honor of facilitating. I truly have to thank every single one of our panelists here today and also that were here prior. You all have made it fantastic and I have gained a lot of insights and things that I want to implement in my teaching next year and beyond. So thank you so much for sharing what you have learned and your experiences with all of us. I think we have all benefited greatly from what you have to share. So thank you for being here for us. And there are some uh, things in the chat I also do want to draw your attention to, and I, I apologize if I missed it, but there will be a uh, third and final um, uh, survey that we'll be sending out. And we do appreciate your honest feedback. These help us to essentially you know, drive our, our OOP series in the direction that's going to be best for everyone. We ultimately want to make these webinars the best we possibly can for all of you. So good feedback, neutral feedback, even some negative feedback. This is all very helpful for us. So we do appreciate you taking a few minutes just to share your honest opinions and thoughts and what you're taking with you from our webinar series today, as well as our series in general. And thank you all so much for being here. Uh, for those of you who are planning on earning the digital badge, which we hope you will, uh, or and or the CEU credits, just depending on your particular situation, if you do want to hang back for a minute, I would be happy to share my screen and walk you through the process just so everybody's clear on that. Uh, but otherwise, if you are not planning to earn the badge, we will bid you a fond ma mahalo and a fond aloha. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And if you are planning on earning the badge, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and uh, share that with you. Also, Jim just did put a note in that our recordings are going to be available. They're going to be up on our LLP website for anyone who wants to go back and revisit these at any time. They are going to be available for you to revisit. So thank you for that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I want to show you our OLP website and kind of walk you through the process of earning that digital badge, which we hope you will. Okay, so right now I am currently on our OOP website. I'll go ahead and put this into the chat for anyone if you just need to quickly bookmark that. And there we go. Okay, so if you wanna go ahead and bookmark our website for our LLP series, please go ahead and do so. And all of our information about the format, information about our panelists is here. And we also have these helpful resources that have been posted here. Now, these are not resources that we at NFLRC have gone through and vetted, but our fantastic panelists have mentioned these. So these might be worth checking out. And if you feel that they are a fit for you and the type of activities that you're looking to do with your students, please go ahead and feel free to check those out. We would be happy to have you explore those. And down here with products, it does explain that you are eligible, anyone is eligible to earn the digital badge. And depending on your circumstances, you might also be eligible to earn CEUs for participating in our series. 
And again, if you are not part of the NCVPS group, it would definitely help to reach out to those in charge of giving CEUs out and explaining what the series is like, the activities that we're asking you to do just to check and make sure that everything would be okay for you getting the credit. And so the criteria is listed here. We want to make sure that we go through and read each of these and be sure that we've fulfilled all of these. So those of you who were here for all three of our in-person sessions, or rather our synchronous sessions, rather, I should say, uh, our, all three of our synchronous sessions, definitely want to make sure that you have attended all of those and be sure that you have completed all the activities in our Padlet. And it would be the a total of nine responses. So there were three posts per session, three sessions. So there's a total of nine posts that you'll need to make. And be sure whenever you are making those posts that you put the name that you use to register for the conference into your response. That way we can keep track and denote who did what and give credit where credit is due. There is also a three, two, one reflection that we'll ask you to do for each live session. Now, if you scroll down a little bit further, there is the three, two, one reflection template. If you click on that, it will take you directly to the template. And basically what you need to do is make a copy of this and you will create your own three, two, one reflection for each of the sessions. There's an example here. And obviously this is not based on anything that we discussed in our particular sessions here, but it's three things you learn, two things you plan to implement into your teaching practice and one question that you might still have. And you'll go ahead and create one for each of these. And again, you do need to make a copy of this. And then once you've gone ahead and made your own copy and filled in your information, uh, going out to, oops, going back out to our uh, website, you want to make sure that you also have completed all of the hands-on activities as well. And actually, I'll go ahead and take you out to that page. And this is the page where we explain our hands-on activities. And this portion should be a total of three hours invested into exploring resources and creating your own artifacts that hopefully you'll be able to use in your own teaching practice if you so choose. But the idea behind it, at least whenever I was designing these, was I wanted to give educators the opportunity to create something that they would be able to implement next year or maybe even the year after or later and hopefully be able to take something with you rather than just kind of passively listening to another webinar. I'm hoping that you'll actually have something you'll be able to implement into your classroom. So we give some guiding questions to think about as you're creating these. And there's three different activities. The first is related to using resources to teach Mandarin online, where you're going out and either looking for resources to use for your students or making your own resources, depending on what you are trying to help students with. The idea behind this is to think about some areas where your students might struggle a little bit and where might they be able to use some additional instruction and other resources for them. The second activity involves creating an interactive experience in the online environment. We talked about that extensively on Wednesday about how we can make the online environment a little bit more interactive for our students. And then the third and final activity is about creating assessments with feedback in the online environment. So you will go ahead and create some type of assessment, whether that be formative, summative, anything in between, and thinking about some feedback you might be able to give to the students based on how they did on that assessment. So there's, they're pretty open-ended activities. I know a lot of people teach a lot of different types of classes, so I didn't wanna to be too constraining in the parameters. Really what I, the goal is to make something that would help your students. And so by completing all of these, I believe that's going to be the final component. Now there is a, a form and the link is on our OLP website, but there's a form you'll go ahead and fill out with all of your information. And you will specify what you are looking to receive in exchange for completing these activities, whether you want the digital badge, CEU credits from North Carolina Virtual, or CEU credits at your institution. Now, these are not mutually exclusive. They might apply to you or not apply to you, depending on what you are looking to do. And you'll also select the form in which you'll be submitting your work. If you're going to use Google Docs, you're free to do that. Just be sure to select that everyone with the link can view. I can certainly vouch so many times my students forget to do that and I have to follow up with them. So just be sure that we can actually view the work that you've submitted. Or if you want to send those in in Microsoft Word files, that's just fine. And then on the uh, next part, you'll either submit 
uh, your link or go ahead and send in um, those in, in the file format. And then you go ahead and click, no, it's gonna make me do this, but basically once you have that information filled out, it is going to take you to um, the last part where you are going to make your final submissions. And we will go ahead and check and verify that you have submitted everything. And once that has been done, um, we will eventually be sending the digital badges and or potentially sending out information for your CEU. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention about that is that we do have a deadline of July 15th for everything to be completed. So if you are planning on earning the badge and or the credit, please be mindful of the time. And that was everything that we have for uh, our official webinar series. And again, we do want to thank our panelists and all of our participants for joining us. This has definitely been one for the books and quite possibly one of the most fun that I've ever facilitated. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to our friends of NFRs LFC for making this happen. We appreciate you and we look forward to joining you for a future OLP series. Mahalo and aloha.